Welcome to the Pulled House Workshop video series. This is the first detailed video in the sharpening video set. I've chosen to dedicate this video to water stones. First, some terminology. Water stones and wet stones are not necessarily the same thing. A water stone is a wet stone, but a wet stone is not always a water stone. Wet stones are a combination of two words, uh, obviously stone being the second half of the word, and wet being the first half, and wet is W-H-E-T, which means to sharpen a tool. Um, so a water stone can be a wet stone, but a wet stone can also be an oil stone. So there's a little uh, confusion there sometimes just because of the homonym, but not a big deal. Uh, Whetstones themselves date back thousands of years. Early Romans used whetstones in the shape of a big grinding wheel that they had to carve themselves. <clears throat> and they would take the tool to the edge of that grinding wheel to put a surface on it. Um, they used a lot of tools for stonework, but they also did a lot of carpentry. Um, those early whetstones were huge and immobile. Often, um, the whetstone we think of today as something small enough that you could probably put in your pocket. They did have, but they were not as common. Um, usually there would be one sharpener for an entire work site, um, so they would, they would just have one giant sharpening wheel. Water stones as we know them today date back uh, probably close to 2,000 years. Japanese woodworkers were mining uh, their traditional whetstones uh, several thousand years ago. There are both now natural and man-made stones as uh, the natural stones have been mined out for quite some time. Um, there are still a few existing mines but because it's relatively inexpensive to produce man-made stones now and they're fairly cheap it just makes more sense to to make them rather than go through the labor and cost of trying to mine them. Uh, there are mines in Belgium which produce natural stones. They have both blue and yellow garnet embedded stones. The garnet is a rhomboid shape which uh, aids in sharpening the, the base of the tool. It has uh, rhomboid shaped garnets embedded in a clay medium which slowly wear away as you sharpen. Uh, those are considered to be some of the best. Uh, there are still a few Japanese mines own, uh, owned and operated. Most of their techniques are very labor intensive however to get the stones so they're extremely expensive. Um, they, they use some tunneling techniques and some some older mining techniques to get to the deposits of, of uh, sharpening stones. Typically the natural stones are a combination of a sharpening medium, um, sometimes a micronized uh, quartz, uh, sometimes um, the garnet that I spoke of, and sometimes other mediums in, embedded in a clay matrix. Uh, the clay is basically what you notice on the stone as a lot of the color. Um, the, the garnet in the yellow stone and the blue Belgian stones does add some color to the stone. Um, but typically there's a lot more clay than there is sharpening medium. So as you work the tool across the surface of both man-made and natural stones, you are actually wearing away some of that clay matrix, which f then frees some of the cutting medium. There are in fact some cheap versions of natural water stones available today. Unfortunately, most of these inexpensive stones are plagued with uh, dead spots in the stone or uh, organic materials in the stone, some variances in cutting medium grit, so they're not necessarily the best choice. Uh, if you really were interested in a water stone and you didn't want to pay the price, I would go man-made because the, uh, the cheap natural stones are exactly that. Most of the natural stones are from three places in the world. Um, you've got Belgium, Europe, uh, they used to have a lot come out of Turkey, um, but now it's Japan and China. Uh, China has, has been producing some excellent finishing stones. Uh, a lot of them are very hard. They're around a 12,000 grit 
and they're very slow grinding because they're so hard. Um, but they're, I've heard that they're excellent for putting an edge on a, on a tool, but it does take some time. Synthetic stones are what I have today. Um, they're cheap, readily available, and they're actually excellent. There's a good quality control on them, and you can pick them up in just about any grit size. Uh, the, the nice thing about them is, in fact, the quality control. Uh, I've got an 8000 Grit King, and on the previous video I said 400, which was an error. This is a 4000 Grit King. And then I've got a combination stone, which I have the box for here, which is a 250 and 1000 Grit. This is the King Waterstone box. All of these came in a box similar to this. This is nice because it's got a stone on each side. There is a little issue of mixing grits. Fortunately, these two are pretty close, but I wouldn't want to keep my 8,000 grit stone in the same water as my coarser stones, simply because I don't want to contaminate this nice, fine 8,000 grit stone with uh, abrasives from, say, the 250. The coarser stones I store in water. Uh, which I also keep in my house because the workshop gets cold. Uh, with water stones, you have to remember that if they're full of water and it gets cold outside, they can freeze and burst. The finer grit synthetic water stone, I don't store in the water. I put it in the water about a half hour before I'm ready to sharpen, um, as with any of the stones that are water stones that you don't store in water. Uh, and it lets it soak up a bunch of water so that all I have to do is add a small amount to the surface to create my working slurry. Natural stones, almost all of them, you don't store in the water. Um, you put them in water shortly before you're ready to sharpen. The issue there is that they have natural faults in them which can rupture due to long exposure in the water. Additionally, the clay matrix, it, not having been processed by man, um, will break down naturally in the water. It's just part of what the stone does. Additionally, two-sided stones are available naturally because of natural faults that occur within some stones. Uh, I know Belgium blue and Belgium yellow you can get in a double-sided stone. It just occurs naturally in the ground that way. Uh, they're close enough together and the, the fissure is small enough between the two that they produce a two-sided stone. Those are relatively expensive, which is why I don't own them, um, but I have heard excellent things about uh, all the, the Belgian's natural stones. Um, those are available online, or some higher-end woodworking stores will carry those. These, I find, meet my needs very well. They were relatively inexpensive, as I said, and they're easy to maintain. I keep the coarser ones in this plastic bin, and I just kind of keep it in here so I can transport it between the house and the workshop when I come out to work. Now all three of these stones uh, are man-made as I said but not all of them come flat out of the box. I noticed actually these two were not flat. This one, the double-sided stone, actually came pretty flat. <clears throat> Flattening these stones, whether they're natural or synthetic, is a reality of life. Um, they, they hollow quickly um, but they also cut fairly quickly, so there's a bit of a trade-off there. Flattening the stones is not a problem. Um, I've used this tool to flatten them. This is the DMT Duo Sharp diamond plate. I also use this Norton flattening plate, which works great. Uh, I do like the diamond plate system, though, because I can wash it off between stones. The Norton, I can wash off, but still may retain some of the grit from a coarser stone if I want to flatten a finer stone. As I, I don't want to get grit embedded from my 250 into my 8000, it sort of defeats the purpose of a nice, fine grit stone. Additionally, this DMT plate has got real small circles in it. There are little grooves that catch some of the the uh, slurry as I'm wasting away the stone on there. <clears throat> so I'll use that for the demonstration. However, the process for the Norton is exactly the same. What we'll do is start with a trusty number two pencil and we'll try the 8000 grit. 
mark a grid across the stone. Doesn't have to be perfect, but we basically want pencil lines in every quadrant of the stone the left, the right, top and bottom, and in the center. So as we wear away the stone, these pencil marks will start to disappear in certain areas of the stone. Those we know were higher than the others that it leaves behind. And you just continue to flatten the stone until all of your pencil marks disappear. And then you know you've achieved one level surface across the entirety of the stone. With a couple of sprays of water on here. Set the stone down. There we go. Now we can see we've already started to wear away the center of this stone, leaving behind these two edges. Now those were probably hollow from flattening the bottom of a chisel across that edge. <clears throat> so continue to flatten. And, and sometimes as you're flattening or sharpening one chisel on here, you may have to flatten this stone two, three times. And there we go. Simple as that. You can see all my pencil marks are gone, so the stone is nice and flat. Now I'll wash this off between stones. <clears throat> I have already flattened these two stones, uh, the same process, draw your grid, flatten it across the top, and I wash this in between. Additionally, um, with the water, you can use soap uh, mixed with your water on these, and it will help to float some of the slurry to the surface and get rid of the metal filings that end up in here, and those are called swarf, and it will help float all that up to the surface so that you're not clogging the pores of your stone. Uh, I've heard of people putting these in their dishwasher. I don't know that I would trust that. Um, personally, with my stones, um, the ceramic stones you can do that with, but I would worry about the heat drying of these. Uh, the rapid heat drying may damage the stone. <clears throat> Once you flatten the top of the stone, you want to make sure that your edges are all beveled. This prevents, as you're riding a chisel across the surface of this uh, stone, you don't want to chip away these edges of your stone and leave rough surfaces. You want it to be a nice, flat, continuous edge. So we'll take the stone, roughly 45, and just wear this edge off. It doesn't take much. There, we got a nice bevel. We do this to all four surfaces. There we go. Just real simple. The DMT is also nice because if I've got a brand new tool or an antique tool like this big timber framer from Witherby, um, I can flatten the back on this extremely quickly. Uh, the coarse cutting diamond and then on the other side it's got a, uh, a medium uh, grit diamond plate. It's the same setup, <clears throat> but it's extremely fast cutting. And because it uses water, I just clean it off right in between no problem and I get to flattening the back same way I would work with these set it on here make sure it's flat kind of loosely hold it with this hand to guide it back and forth set up a depth gauge with this finger I don't feel there's any need to flatten the entire back of this chisel um, really only you know this last or even sometimes the last half inch are all you really need to have perfectly flat when you set it into uh, a knife line or along the edge of a shoulder of a cut, <clears throat> you're just making sure that this back is parallel. It provides a nice reference surface, and then really to get it sharp, you're really only concerned with this last bit being perfectly flat so that it meets at a perfect angle with the bevel. So we'll set this on here, and I can feel it kind of rock flat, apply pressure. This one's wide enough I can use two fingers, <clears throat> apply an even pressure. Make sure I don't knock anything off my bench, and 